The 1950s, Hollywood. A creative time in film history when movie studios were not as restrained by commercial considerations or great amount of oversight by studio heads. There was a competitive atmosphere between studios like Warner Brothers, Paramount, and 20th Century Fox. And one of the greatest assets working in Hollywood of this most interesting time was English-born Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock, or Hitch, as he was known to his friends and colleagues, was perhaps at the very peak of his powers during the 1950s. Rear Window, Dial In For Murder, Rope, Notorious, Saboteur, and Rebecca were just a few classics he had already made, and he was yet to make three more of his greatest films. He even had a suspense-type television show called Alfred Hitchcock Presents that first aired in 1955. Hitchcock's success in Hollywood allowed him to have an unprecedented amount of creative control over his films and television he was directly involved in. But perhaps the greatest and most personal of his spectacular ovir of films was none other than Vertigo. This video was about the making of this most treasured classic, its initial reception and its reevaluation over time, and a little personal opinion about it too. In early 1955, Hitchcock had seen Henri Georges Clouseau's Les Diaboliques and was impressed by the concept of the film. It had been based on a French book called Celle qui n'est plus, written by Pierre Boileau and Thomas Narsajac, and Hitchcock was keen to purchase the rights to any of their future work. Their next book, called De Entre les Morts, about a former police detective who suffers from vertigo, or a fear of heights, and is hired by a friend to follow his wife who is behaving strangely. The detective then falls in love with the troubled wife, goes through a mental breakdown, and becomes obsessed with her. Such plot elements intrigued Hitchcock enough for him to naturally bear fruit to further ideas for a film, so he subsequently pitched the concept to Paramount Pictures, and they then bought the rights to the book in April 1955 for just over 25,000 US dollars. After going through two previous writers, playwright Samuel A. Taylor produced a draft Hitchcock accepted. A budget of 2.5 million US dollars, a modest budget for the time, was secured, and the production then moved on to casting. Jimmy Stewart, a common sight in Hollywood films and perhaps the most bankable Hollywood actor at the time, was cast as John Scotty Ferguson, the renamed leading detective role. Vera Miles, who was under personal contract to Hitchcock and had appeared in both his television show and Hitchcock's previous project, The Wrong Man, was originally cast in the film as Madeline, the named troubled wife, but due to delays in the production thanks to Hitchcock being ill, Miles then became pregnant and had to withdraw, leaving the role open for Kim Novak to be cast in Miles' part. Other actors in the film included Barbara Bel Geddes as Scotty's longtime friend and confidant, and English actor Tom Helmore as Scotty's employer and Madeline's husband. Production commenced in September of 1957 and ended in December of that same year. The exteriors were filmed on location in San Francisco and also in the town of San Juan Batista, 90 miles south of San Francisco. And afterwards, production then moved to Paramount Studios in Los Angeles to film the interior scenes. During production, Hitchcock had innovated a camera technique known today as the push-pull or vertigo effect, where the grip equipment and camera team push the camera forward and zoom out at the same time to animate Scotty's fear of heights, which at the time was an innovative solution in the days where filmmaking technology was, compared to today, very limited. The technique was heightened by the innovative and high-quality VistaVision camera system, a system that fed 35mm film through the camera gate horizontally instead of vertically, allowing for images to be shot on a larger area. With 70mm film, this was sort of a precursor to IMAX. This technique was inspired when Hitchcock had fainted during a party some years before the making of this movie and had recalled this event and put it into filmmaking language. The score of the film was composed by regular Hitchcock collaborator Bernard Herrmann, who composed a score that was romantic and tragic at the same time, supplementing Hitchcock's vision. After six months of post-production, including a complex animation sequence and titles by the renowned Saul Bass, Vertigo premiered in San Francisco on May 9, 1958. The film was not well received upon release, and the general blame was placed upon Jimmy Stewart for being cast in a role of which he was too old. Hitchcock and Stewart never worked together again, and Hitchcock became embittered over Vertigo's lack of success. But the story of Vertigo has an interesting twist. After being removed from circulation in 1973, Vertigo was re-released in 1983 for its 25th anniversary, three years after Hitchcock had passed away. 
After being released on video cassette in October 1984, the film achieved an impressive commercial success and was hailed as one of, if not Alfred Hitchcock's greatest film, even greater than Psycho. The film was then deemed culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and chosen for preservation in the National Film Registry in 1989. It was then restored in 1996 thanks to the efforts of film historians Robert Harris and James Katz, who had also restored such classics as Lawrence of Arabia, Spartacus, and My Fair Lady. The restoration of Vertigo cost more than a million US dollars. Its re-release that year was on a restored 70mm print and had an enhanced DTS soundtrack. In 2012, Vertigo passed Citizen Kane as the greatest film ever made after a poll of film critics conducted by British magazine Sight and Sound taking away a position Orson Welles' old masterpiece had for 50 years. So what is it that makes Vertigo as good as it is? Vertigo is just one example of Hitchcock's innovative storytelling genius. It has all the elements that make up a Hitchcock film. A mystery story, visceral shots of people under stress, a haunting score, female characters who come off as cold and distant, and a cameo by Hitchcock himself. It is a prime example of how Hitchcock, quoting the man himself, plays the audience like a piano. The film has somewhat unrelated elements in it. In addition to the main detective procedural story, it also has sub-elements of love, obsession, murder, body doubles, and deception. But Hitchcock was able to make all these elements come together with the main story so beautifully that everything serves the main plot of the story without it being a distraction. It is also a boldly artistic film, colors like red, which suggests love and heightened emotion, and stale green, which suggests morbidity and death, are in vibrant display in scenes like when Scotty sees Madeline for the first time and when Madeline appears in Graveyard. But one of the more dominant themes in Vertigo is that of obsession. This theme really comes into its own during the second half of the film when, after Madeline apparently commits suicide by jumping off a bell tower, Scotty then finds another lady named Judy who looks strikingly similar to Madeline. We see this disturbing, harrowing, and frankly heartbreaking sequence of events in Scotty making this woman over into the appearance of the deceased woman whom he is still so madly in love with. This kind of treatment towards women, particularly blonde women, was a common element in Hitchcock films. In a way, Vertigo is something of an autobiographical film. Hitchcock himself could be placed into the shoes of Jimmy Stewart's character. Hitchcock used perhaps his most common technique, voyeurism, to depict Scotty's obsession developing. Scotty becomes obsessed with this woman by watching her from a distance. Hitchcock often subjected his female stars, very often playing ice-cold, unsympathetic characters, to oppressive and demeaning treatment in his films, but this one less so. Madeline is far more sympathetic than most female characters in other Hitchcock films, like Janet Leigh in Psycho, Grace Kelly in Rear Window, or Tippi Hedren in Marnie. She is a deeply conflicted character caught up in an elaborate murder plot who just so happens to meet and fall in love with Jimmy Stewart's character. And finally, there is one scene in this film that is perhaps the truest testament to Hitchcock's genius. After the grueling process of Scotty shaping Judy to his liking, Judy adjusts her hair to exactly resemble the apparently deceased Madeline, and then suddenly, a swath of emotions hits Scotty. He is convinced that the woman he is looking at is Madeline reborn. They come together, and in a revolving camera shot that expresses the sea of passion and suspicion that ensues, Scotty then begins to suspect that Madeline never died at all, and at the same time express disbelief at being with Madeline again. In this one shot, every single plot element, every single emotional thread of the story and both these characters comes together in a sea of love, obsession, further plot unraveling. It is undeniably one of the greatest scenes ever put on film, for a filmmaker to put together such a difficult scene like this with so many different emotional dynamics and make it work so beautifully is no easy feat and something perhaps no other film director has, has been able to do so successfully. Vertigo is a film that must be seen to truly understand Hitchcock's genius. It is a film that is really on another level of greatness to even the great classics. It is also a bold film takes chances, artistic chances, that were, more so now, generally considered too risky in an industry that revolves around money and profits. It is refreshing to see rare films that actually do this by an even rare breed of filmmaker. Where should we go for dinner? Anywhere you like. Ernie's? You have a thing about Ernie's, don't you? Well, after all, it's our place. 